Hey folks, my name is Micah and I'll be talking about bringing your PWA to app stores. First off, I'll go over why you might even want to do this. And next, I'll talk about some of the mechanics, how to package your PWA for various app stores, and some of the tools and APIs you're going to use along the way. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk a bit about my own experience packaging my company's PWA for the Google Play Store on Chrome OS, um, and also some of the things we had to figure out around payment. Uh, you can view these slides at the link below, tinyurl slash PWA app stores. Cool. So first off, why app stores? Um, the main reason is just discovery, right? Um, your PWA is already a website. Chances are SEO is a top priority for you. But especially if your product is more like an app and users, users might expect to find it on the app store, right? If you tell somebody about it, it might be the first place they look. Also, users search for apps in App Store, you know, by keyword or by category. So being there just makes your app more discoverable. Um, along the same lines, uh, users are used to installing apps from the App Store. I love PWAs. <laughs> I've installed all sorts of PWAs and I'm very familiar with it, but a lot of users aren't, right? So it gives a little more legitimacy to your app installation process. And the biggest reason, at least for us when we were looking into this, is that it's really relatively painless to distribute your PWA on an app store. Um, it's really the same code base, but increased distribution. Um, when you update you know, your website, your PWA updates based on your service worker, well, if your PWA is also in the Play Store or the Microsoft Store, it's the same update path. It uses all the same assets. It's just a website that's, that's packaged, right? So um, it's really easy. It is, <laughs> it'd be much more tricky if you're trying to do you know, React Native or really change your code base, but this isn't the case. Um, that's why we were so interested in it. Cool, so which app stores are available to you? Um, first off, we have the Play Store, which is obviously on Android, but also on Chrome OS, which I'll be talking about a bit in this talk. Then there's the Microsoft Store on Windows. Um, and the Samsung Galaxy Store on Android, which was actually a new one for me. Um, and then finally, there's the App Store, and I put an asterisk by it for two reasons. First off, Apple doesn't encourage the submission of packaged websites to the App Store. So they'll want you to do something different in your UI or essentially have something that clearly distinguishes your packaged PWA or website from your actual PWA or website, right? Uh, and the second thing along these lines is it's just a lot trickier to do. There's no like one click convert my PWA into, you know, an installable iPhone app or something. You're going to need to go into Xcode, create a web view with Swift, set up some sort of bridging and messaging between Swift and your JavaScript. Um, and that's all doable. We're actually exploring doing it right now. Uh, but it just it just takes a little more setup and a little more know how. <laughs> so I won't be discussing that in this talk, even though it, it is an option. Cool. So uh, I'm going to go through a really quick uh, a quick start here using pwabuilder.com, which is an open source project that makes it really, really easy to convert your PWA into a packaged PWA that's ready for any app store. Um, so the first step is really just going to uh, pwabuilder.com. And we're going to stick in uh, the URL to your website. It really just has to be the URL to any page on your site that has a web app manifest. It's going to load it in the background, um, similar to how you might do with, uh, oh, <laughs> um, Lighthouse or a tool like that, right? Um, it's going to inspect your manifest service worker, similar to Lighthouse, right? Just kind of give you a report card and overview of things that could be improved. Here it looks like we're doing pretty well. Um, though in the manifest, it, it's going to suggest that uh, I add a shortcut. Um, so a couple shortcuts for like deep linking into my app, which is something we're actually hoping to do in the future. Um, anyway, if you pass the report card or whatever, you just click next and then you're off to the races, right? Um, you have these buttons on the right hand side that allow you to export your PWA for all of these various app stores. Um, so you have the Microsoft store for Windows. Um, and it's as simple as clicking on one of those buttons to generate a package. Then you have the Google Play Store and Android. And this is also for Chrome OS, not just Android, which I'll be talking about a little later. And then finally, last but not least, there's the Samsung Galaxy Store. And you can submit your PWA to Samsung and they'll and work with them to get it on their platform as well. Now, in our case, uh, we, were, we wanted to get especially on Chrome OS. That was our platform of choice. And so we generated a, a PWA for uh, the Google Play Store. 
And I want to draw your attention here to uh, TWA in the package ID. That's just a little bit of jargon um, Google Play Store uses to refer to a PWA. It's called a trusted web activity that's been packaged for the Google Play Store on Android or Chrome OS. So that's all that means, a featured trusted web activity. Now, in PWA Builder, it's going to show you all the various options you can use um, in your packaged uh, PWA. One of them you can customize is the start URL. For instance, maybe you want to give your users a little different experience, or maybe you're just using it for analytics, which I'll go over later. As you can see, there's actually a ton of options here. <laughs> um, so if you're a developer like me, it, I mean, you can use a GUI to generate your packaged PWA, um, but there's something nice about actually just being able to view the source code. So that was, that was my preference when I was working on this. Um, I, what I wanted to see is something a little closer to, uh, to this. <laughs> Here you can see the JSON with, and my TWA manifest.json. So this is for the Play Store. And I can just see all the options that I'm, I'm specifying uh, for the Android wrapper around my PWA. And the way you get to something like this is using the bubble wrap CLI. So bubble wrap is specific to packaging your PWA for the Play Store. Um, it's a super simple command line utility. You install it with NPM, you call bubble wrap init with the URL to your web app manifest. And it's gonna do the same thing that PWA Builder, it just sticks all those files in a folder that you can then version control and track over time. Um, to give you a sense, here's one of our git diffs <laughs> for the current bubble wrap project that I'm working on. And as you can see, so I updated the version of the app so that users would get the latest uh, you know, Android wrapped PWA. But I also update, and in this case, bubble wrap also updated. And so it updated, it looked like the Android browser helper <laughs> for billing in this case, right? So um, it's really nice to version control this sort of thing because then you can not just see, you know, what PWA code you're shipping, which really just depends on uh, what assets you're shipping to the browser, but also the wrapper around your PWA, if any changes have happened to that that you need to be aware of. Um, beyond a, a couple updates a year just to make sure your bubble wrap or you know PWA builder wrapper is up to date. You really only need to update your PWA in the store when your icons change. So it's it's uh, it's not a lot of maintenance. Um, check in on it every few months, but it's much lower maintenance than actually having like a native you know app that you build in Xcode or Android Studio or something like that. Cool. So. Um, the next section, I'm going to jump into a quick case study of BeFunky.com, which is where I work. Um, we built a PWA back, I want to say it was back in November or December, it kind of released it to all of our users. And then we're looking to just like get more out of it, to put it in more app stores and kind of, I'm going to uh, just walk you through how we thought about that problem, right? Um, so first off, what is BeFunky? <laughs> BeFunky is an online photo editor, collage maker, and graphic designer. It's similar to Canva if you use that before. A creative platform where you can, you know, drag in your photos and make interesting, you know, things, <laughs> interesting projects. Uh, one of the most interesting things about BeFunky is it has a built-in uh, WebGL-based photo editor. So you don't have to use a separate program to edit your photos. You can kind of just dive into your postcard or collage or, you know, Instagram ad, grab a photo, swap out its background, um, we have a lot of AI based tools. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of, uh, creative, uh, stuff. Cool. So, uh, at BeFunky, uh, we try to keep our front end as lean and mean as possible. Um, we use WebGL for all of the photo editing, a lot of the UI, uh, the actual canvas that you're working on is WebGL. And then everything around it, we try to keep, you know, really lean and performant. Um, and yeah, <laughs> try to use DOM standards when we can. So. Uh, we use web components, we use LitHTML for rendering, and if this sort of approach to building UIs and building products appeals to you, let me know. Um, we're hiring right now, and I'd love to work, to, work with you if, you're, if this is the sort of thing that makes you tick. Anyway, uh, so who's our audience? We're a software as a, server co software as a service company. Um, our audience is mostly desktop, um, simply because it's a little easier to build things, um, like design projects when you're on more of a desktop device and on, on your phone. Uh, we do have quite a few tablet users too, and we're releasing a mobile interface this, this fall, but most of our audience is desktop. Um, two to three million monthly folks actually using the product and 6,000 currently active PWA users per month, which is a drop in the bucket, 
but we see a lot higher engagement from PWA users than we do from just normal website users. So that's why we're investing in it. Um, and we measure engagement simply on like, how often are people saving projects, right? Like what are they doing in the app? And it's just, yeah, we see a, a, a lot of engagement from that. So that's why we're interested in, you know, distributing our PWA in more app stores. Um, and then why the Play Store in particular, it really comes down to Chrome OS for us. So Chrome OS, which is used by Chromebooks, um, was the second most popular computer in 2020 in terms of sales, right? Um, and since our app is already really optimized for desktop experiences in particular, you know, Chrome OS, we had already optimized for, and so bundling for it was really, really easy to do. Um, and in the future, I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, uh, also, you know, bundle this PWA for Android and do the same for Windows, maybe in the Samsung Galaxy App Store. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's a fairly, fairly trivial process. I'm going to go through the steps here. So you use Bubble Wrap to package up your PWA. Um, that just creates a little Android wrapper, which really just contains your icons and a URL, uh, it really just your start URL for the PWA. Um, so you run Bubble Wrap, you, uh, you know, upload your AAB file, which is an Android app bundle to the Google Play Console. It'd be a very, very similar process if you're doing this for the Microsoft Store for Samsung. And then you just create a new release. You usually start off with, you know, a testing release so you can kind of try it out and then you release your production. Uh, we've only had our uh, app in the store for like a month and a half now, so we don't have really solid numbers and how it's performing. But, you know, use, usage is growing significantly, and uh, I think once we start promoting it, we'll really see some good numbers. So, one, one note here. <laughs> the blessing and the curse of PWAs and app stores is that they're just PWAs, right? You're using all of the same code. Um, the great thing about that is it's very easy to keep it updated. The downside is that it can be hard to tell it apart, um, your packaged PWA from the PWA that just installed from Chrome, right? Whatever Chromium browser you're using. Um, one way to do that is you can customize the start URL uh, when you deploy your PWA in an app store, right? Um, so in our case, we had a little hash to the start URL, which tells us, oh, this PWA is being installed from the Google Play Store instead of from Chrome. Um, there's a little article here if you're interested in, in how, to, how to track that. Um, yeah, anyway, so the, the last section of this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into payments. Um, and payments are probably the only, yeah, the, the only really significant uh, part of your app that you'll have to change if you're looking to get your PWA into an existing app store. If your PWA doesn't accept payments or subscriptions, then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you're home free. But if you are accepting payments, um, like we are, you know, a software as a service company, then it's something you have to think about. Um, yeah, so, and, and, the, and the real reason is just that app stores manage all of these things that you're probably used to managing on your own. So whether that's products and subscriptions and what their prices are and whether or not a user has access to that particular product and subscription, or whether it's, you know, the actual payment flow itself, um, you know, getting the user's payment method, processing that payment, and then handling, you know, renewals and cancellations. So th this process looks different um, in app stores versus in the browser, right? In the browser, you manage it completely. In app stores, the app store manages it for the most part. Um, and in the Play Store specifically, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Microsoft Store behaves fairly similar to this, there's two APIs that you're gonna need to know um, to handle this process. Um, and the interesting thing is that these are actually browser APIs. So um, you'll use them if you put your PWA in an app store, but you'll probably also use them if you just kind of keep working on websites for the next few years. The payment request API in particular, which is used for accepting payments, is in Chromium, it's in Safari, and it's behind a flag in Firefox right now. So this is just used for any website to accept payments. The digital goods API is a little more bleeding edge, and it's currently only used by PWAs in the Play Store. So that's Android and Chrome OS. The digital goods API just keeps track of products and subscriptions, how much they cost, and then whether or not a user has access to them. So I'm gonna go over that one first. It's probably new to most of you. Um, so uh, the digital goods API, again, keeping track of prices and also keeps track of you know, whether or not a user has access to particular things. Um, in our case, we really just used a couple methods, right? So uh, first thing is we get a digital goods service. And this is when the Google Play Store API comes in. Um, but you could also potentially get a digital goods service from the Microsoft Store or maybe even the 
App Store, you know, Apple down the road. Um, so we get access to a service which is going to fulfill this digital goods API request, and then we can ask it for purchases for a current user. Now, in this context, who's the current user? They're the user who is logged in, um, in this case, to their Google account on the Chrome OS device or on the Android phone, right? So that's who the user is in this case. Um, and the Digital Goods API will give our PWA essentially access to like, what have they bought previously? What do they still have access to? In our case, it's as simple as like, have they subscri subscribed to BeFunky Plus or not? The other thing it does for you is you can give it a product SKU or unique ID, and it'll give you back the price for that product. Now you may have entered that in US dollars, right? But it'll give you the price for that product in the user's current language and in their preferred currency. So from a user's perspective, you know, if they're in a different currency, they don't have to worry about, you know, trying to do that conversion in their head. They'll get back, you know, the data in, in, in a way that actually makes sense to them. Um, now this can be a bit of a headache as a developer, you know, <laughs> if you stick in your price of $4.99 and you get back, you know, your currency in euros or yen or something like that. But there is another browser API uh, the number format helper, which essentially just translates. Uh, you give it a, a currency, a value, a locale, and it gives you a string back that you can you know, stick on your website that'll render that price in a way that the user is going to understand. Um, we even do some post-processing to it to make the price look a little nicer, right? We might make the major unit look small, larger than the minor unit and stuff like that. But the number format API is like a great starting point for this. Cool, and then the last API you're gonna to need to get familiar with is the Payment Request API. Um, this is already used extensively on a lot of websites. If you've used Stripe for billing, um, it's built into some of the, like that Stripe payment button, which you've probably used before, and, and quite, a other, quite a few other you know, browser-based payment providers use it. Uh, and all it does is it processes a payment um, using a native dialogue, again, in the user's preferred currency and locale, right? So that they really understand what's going on. Um, I'll show you a, a really brief video here of the payment request API in action on the BeFunky.com website. So here the user is gonna you know, select an effect, apply it to their photo, make some tweaks, and then to actually save their photo with this effect, they're gonna start a free trial and select a monthly plan. And now at the bottom, you see the payment request API open up this native dialogue that prompts them to pay. So that's what, it, that's what it's giving us here in this case. Um, I'm gonna go through a really quick code sample just so you can kind of see how this works. Uh, <laughs> this is not a production ready code sample. You'll notice there's no uh, try catch statements here or, there's no, or dot catch statements because this is all promise based, right? Um, it's assuming that everything just works, but I wanted to narrow down the code to the bare essentials so you can kind of get a good mental model for how this works. And there's lots of great docs online. Um, so the first step is just, we're gonna show a prompt to the user, which we just saw in the past video, uh, asking them to pay. In this case, we pass in a given you know, SKU for a product, so what are they paying for? And then it handles you know, getting the right price and rendering that right price. And if the user actually chooses to pay for a product or subscription, then we get back a purchase token, which is probably similar to any other payment API you've used. Um, the next step, it's also probably very familiar to you. You get that purchase token, then you validate it on your back end, right? So in this case, we're showing the user a load screen. We're sending that purchase token off to our API where we check in with the Google Play Store API and make sure like, is this purchase token valid? If it is, we go ahead and we upgrade our user at that point so that they then have access to those features. At least in our database, we upgrade them. The next step is using the digital goods service to validate or and sorry, to acknowledge the payment, right? Because uh, the payment request API makes the payment, the digital goods service keeps track of whether the user has access to the thing that was paid for, right? In this case, the subscription. This is important. If we don't acknowledge the payment with the digital goods API, the user will be refunded <laughs> because they don't have access to the thing, right? Um, so it's really just these three steps. This last step is more of a formality. It's just telling the payment request uh, API that it worked. Um, in this case, it should close that native payment prompt at the bottom of the screen if it was in a loading state. Um, and in the future, maybe some user agents will actually show the user a success message or something like that. Um, so that's really it. Um, yeah, yeah, those are your steps for payment. Obviously, it's a different paradigm, but the APIs make it really easy to do.
Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, if you care about web P PWAs and web performance, I'd love to work with you. <laughs> so feel free to reach out to me. Um, and uh, yeah, we're high in, high in front end, full stack devs. And uh, yeah, let me know. And uh, yeah, it'd be great to get in touch. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Um, you can find me on the web at micajohn.com. I'm also on GitHub or Twitter. Feel free to reach out, whoever it makes most sense. I'll probably be live chatting during this talk, so you, you can just do that. Feel free to check out Be Funky at befunky.com slash create. And uh, thanks to Alexander Noe and Sam Richard at Google for encouraging me to give this talk and for all their advice. So, appreciate it.